gave it to you kind of one during one of the first review sessions. So now that we're kind of at crunch time, you know, in terms of getting ready, so let's say you're going to do anything, right, you know, to study on your own. I mean, anything to study on your own. I would say the first thing that I might try is this, right? So this is <coughs> 29 questions, right? So this is 29 questions. Now the advantage of doing this, I'm going to sell this to you on your own. The, the advantage of doing this is not only will this be helpful for the AP test, it will also be helpful for the, the final test that you're taking next Thursday. Because this is the format of the questions. These are the types of questions that you'll have. This will force you to review you know, various things, refresh your memory. I mean, ideally, you would look at this and say, well, OK, the first question is about um, the labor problem in Jamestown between 1607 and, 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 and 1618. And you might say, well, you know, what, what's the labor problem in Jamestown? Well, what that's getting to is slavery, right? You know, that's getting to, to, to kind of a discussion of slavery. So you might say, OK, what do I remember? Check your notes, you know, check your textbook, whatever. You know, and look at that, look at these questions. Why don't I answer? I mean, something. Now, the last question there is this question on, you know, Reagan, kind of. And we're going to talk about that in a second. So you have that, right? And so now I want to give you this, right? So this is, Kravka has attended each of the review sessions up until this one. I want to point that out. Now, Kravka, give these three right behind you. Or four. Give one to Armin, please. Fine. Yeah. Hand this over to Celia. Okay. And what do we have up here? Seven of you guys. Who will reach for these seven? I don't know if I can reach that far. I, I know you can. I can slide under here. You're a gymnast. I mean, that was. I mean, can't you like leap over that yeah. somehow and uh, I'll flip over that? All right. So there's that. Okay. Now let's start with. Oh, I wanted to point out, I wanted to point out this book, so I, um, you know, I'm going to talk to you about Reagan, you know, uh, most, to some extent, you know, about Reagan, and, um, you know, I, I, I just, I, let's say that you had some kind of interest in this topic, modern American history, and you wanted to, to read a book. Now, I didn't read this, but it's well regarded, and I started reading it today you know, kind of to prepare for our conversation. And I like the, the, the preface of it, and I like the introduction, which I read. So I, I'm kind of, you know, based on that, and, and the reputation of this author, I'm going to sort of recommend that this might be a good book to read. I mean, this is one of the ones that I want. It's called The Age of Reagan. And, you know, um, this is a guy that, that's a historian that wasn't necessarily nuts about Reagan's agenda and what he attempted to accomplish but recognizes the importance of what he did and represented in terms of, of history, you know. And so it's kind of an interesting sort of take on it, right? Now, before we get to, to Reagan, however, I want to go to the list of 10 documents. Does anybody not have this? You might not have it with you, right? Do you, does, anybody, does anybody have it with you? The list of ten dollars. If you do not, the heck with it. I'll give you another. One. Pat, you do. Yeah. Um, um, Joe, you do. Yeah. So then that's 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 five here. Celia, you do not. Send one over to Celia. Right. Oh, you do. Yes. Oh, you do. Oh, you do also. I My guys, I think take two out then. Yeah. How many of you guys do have it? I have it. You you have it also. Any of you do not have it up there? Betty. All right, the gymnast, come down and get these uh, with a double gainer and a two and a half. There we go. Oh, my God, is that some little Oh, my God. All right. Now, um, let's take a quick look at those documents. Declaration of Independence, Federalist Papers, Washington's Farewell Address. Let's just briefly for now stop at that and say today, and I, I, I know I did this in third period. I'm not sure if I did it in first period. 
I think I did it in first period. I know I did it in third period. I don't think I did it in fourth period. But I got to the point today where we were, we had introduced the Truman Doctrine, right? And we had said, and the Truman Doctrine is the eighth, is the eighth, eighth document here, right? The Truman Document, uh, Doctrine, and that's 47, that's his speech. The third document is Washington's Farewell Address. Now, if we, if we were comparing Washington's Farewell Address to the Truman Doctrine, what, what in essence, now Washington's farewell address had many aspects to it, but what was the big aspect that we would associate with Washington's farewell address? And, you know, we said this, you know, sort of time and time again. Go ahead, Caleb. Beware of entangling alliances with Right, beware of entangling alliances with European powers. Now, ultimately, you know, that seems to be the best indication, I don't, I don't say indication is the right word, the best representation of the isolationistic attitude that Americans developed over the years. What's our position in the world going to be? You know, where are we going to be in the world? And Washington kind of, you know, sets the stage. And remember, his farewell address is in the aftermath of, of, of this hugely controversial time period of the French Revolution, where the French Revolutionary, you know, you know, government, you know, emerges, you know, um, and then eventually England and France get into a war, and there is a large faction in the United States that wants to support France, and there's another faction that does not want to support France, and you know, wants to remain neutral or support England. And the end result of this is tremendous criticism is heaped on Washington. And he's so frustrated by the criticism and what he calls the French faction that, that is highly critical of his lack of willingness to support this revolution that he says, hey, should we get involved in, 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 you know, in their problems? Look at all the problems it created. Don't we have enough to be, you know, deal with here? If we get entangled, you know, we had this alliance with France that caused all this problem in the first place. Don't do this again. And so that notion of that we can somehow avoid the rest of the world's problems by kind of hunkering down in the Western Hemisphere is, is I don't want to say established by Washington, but reinforced by Washington. Right? And then, even the Monroe Doctrine, I don't, and I don't think that's one of the documents here, but the Monroe Doctrine, you know, kind of further reinforces that. You know, it says, well, look, you know, the Western Hemisphere is our sphere of influence. Europe, you stay out of this. Stay out of our side of the world. You know, it kind of further intensifies this notion of isolationism. And then, you know, in terms of that isolationism, there's always kind of the preoccupation in the United States for internal expansion. You know, I mean, look, you know, we don't need to expand outside the Western Hemisphere because the United States is kind of obsessed with Western expansion, which really doesn't culminate. Western expansion in the United States doesn't culminate until, until 1890. You know, in 1890, remember, the Census Department declared that um, the frontier was closed, and that re resulted in the Turner, you know, the Turner thesis, Frederick Jackson Turner writing that famous, you know, historical paper where he suggested that this was bad for America. Well, it's not uncoincidental that, you know, around 1890, you know, 1896 in particular, the United States, this kind of burgeoning now, you know, you know, more intensely developed country, you know, kind of takes its first foray into, into kind of, you know, foreign affairs and colonization with the Spanish-American War, which starts in the Western Hemisphere, but also includes Asia, right, in the Philippines. You know, it does not include Europe, because that's the source of problems. So the United States solidifies its position in the Western Hemisphere with Cuba, but then extends into Asia, but our interest in Asia is pretty much trade. Now what reflected, what policy reflected our interest in Asia? You know, what policy? We said this was the third pillar of American foreign policy. 
Washington's farewell address, right? Um, the, the Monroe Doctrine, yes. The open door. The open door. So what does that say? We don't want really to, to, to colonize necessarily Asia. We colonize the Philippines because we want trade, the open door. We want free and fair trade, you know, to kind of support the, the economic development of the United States. And that's a question. Can the, the, the industrial might of the United States be sustained with its internal markets? Or does it need to constantly seek external markets? And is this the beginning of it? Well, you know, the United States, you know, they sometimes say that the Spanish-American War is America's coming out party. We're the debutante, right? You know, we, we stepped onto the world stage there, you know, and established, you know, colonial possessions and, you know, in the Philippines and in other places and establish a policy in the Middle East. But, you know, um, isolationism is still a powerful force. It's World War I that challenges that isolationism, right? You know, here is the United States in desperate need of continued trade with the rest of the world in order to maintain our economic power, but the rest of the world is involved in this terrible conflict. And so what does, what does, what does you know, Wilson want? Think about it. His initial goal is neutrality but free trade, right? And, and, and kind of banking on the idea that we could remain somehow isolationistic. We never wanted to be economically isolationistic. You know, Washington didn't say, oh, don't trade with, with European powers. He just said, just don't get involved in their entangling alliances. Free trade is good, oh yeah. We want to trade, we need to trade, right? Hence the Spanish War and World War I what does, what does Wilson do? Demand that people respect our neutrality, countries respect our neutrality. England and France, you know, England and Germany jockey around and do that. And eventually, Germany takes such what we consider to be a barbaric stance against our neutrality that it draws us into war, right? Now, um, you know, the, the backlash against that war is, is, is what tumbles us back into isolationism. You know, you think about it, you know, we get involved in this war and Wilson sells it to the American people not as a way of defending kind of our economic interests, but as a war to make the world safe for democracy, a crusade. You know, we either, if you think about it, up until, you know, and, and even through World War I, we were either isolationistic or crusaders, right? We're either crusading for a cause in World War I or we're going to be isolationistic, but we're not going to be anywhere in between that. So Wilson sells it as a war to make the world safe for democracy, a war to end all wars. When that falls apart, America retreats back into isolationism, right? That retreat into isolationism is so profound that it can't almost be cracked except for an attack on Pearl Harbor. I mean, even up to the day, up to the day that Pearl Harbor was attacked, there was still a, an extraordinarily strong isolationistic sentiment that was prevailing in the United States. And, and Roosevelt was pushing it and testing it. The, 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 um, the uh, quarantine speech in 37. But Pearl Harbor kind of breaks that open. And that's where I, that's where I brought you today in class, which takes you to, to the Truman Doctrine here. I brought you today to the point where, OK, the war is over, right? The world's a mess. And the United States has this question what are we going to do now? After this war, are we going to retreat back into isolationism? Or are we going to a kind of, um, you know, assume global leadership? You know, and, and, and kind of, you know, defend the values and the freedoms and other things and the economic interests. I mean, on one hand, there's the crusading element, defending, you know, the values and interests that we see as important. On the other hand, and that's what Truman is talking about, there's the economic interests. You know, can we sustain our prosperity without world trade to a world that's open to that world trade, not a communist world, right? So <coughs> that's what Truman is asking in the Truman Doctrine. That's what he's saying. You know, look, look, you know, we have to be about supporting free people wherever they are defending freedom, right? So, so that means you have two things there that are connected to what we were, you know, you know, in, in those kind of documents to remember. You know, one is Washington's farewell address. And Truman's 
Truman's, the Truman doctrine is kind of saying, okay, no, we're no longer going to be isolationist. It's the rejection of isolationism and the assumption of, of American leadership in defending what we consider to be democracy. Well, there's going to be other things. I mean, we're going to we're talk about this tomorrow. We're going to get involved in entangling alliances with NATO, which you know continues to be controversial, you know, and, and, and other entangling alliances in other parts of the world, not only with European powers, but with Asiatic powers. But it's, it's a different attitude about America's role in the world. What was our role in the world in 1890, 1896, or 1997, 96, when, when um, you know, Washington, what was our role in the world in, in 1890? How do, we, how do we view our position? How do we view our position in the world in 1947? How do we view our position in the world now? Right? I mean, I think now, if you wanted to do synthesis, you know, there, there, there's a you know, faction of people that actually, you know, Obama and Trump are, are, are kind of similar. Uh, our, world, our role in the world, Obama and, and Trump kind of said the same thing from different positions, is too broad, it's too big, right? We can't solve all the world's problems, right? And Trump said that, and you know, he's more um, bombastic in the way he talks, and, you know, people, and, and, but, but Obama didn't say anything that was kind of remarkably different than that, you know? Um, that we can't solve all the world's problems, and maybe our role in the world was too big, maybe we took on too much, maybe too much is expected of us. You know, maybe more should be. I mean, that's kind of a you know, current debate. But okay, all right. Now you have that. Now let's go now to um, the, um, the the the, the 2015 free response or um, document-based question, right? So Reagan, right? Reagan is 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 what we want to talk about. 2015. Explain the reasons why a new cons why new con excuse me new conservatism rose to prominence in the United States between 1960 and 1989, right? Now, that's the question. Explain the reasons why new conservatism rose in prominence in the United States between 1960 and 1989. Now, that's, that was two years ago the kids had to answer that question. I can tell you flat out, we were almost utterly unprepared for that question, right? I mean, we had talked about a few things in the 1960s, you know, but we had not talked about, you know, conservatism, the rise of conservatism, you know, at all. So we were utterly unprepared for that. Now, I want to tell you that I'm hoping that's not the case this year, you know, but even if it would be in an area, the question would be in an area of something that we talked about, it's still possible that we could be utterly unprepared, right? Now, if that's the case, then what you need to do is go to the documents, right? Now, I, I would like to just, before we go to the documents and take a look at it, state that, you know, what you have to do to respond and get all seven points is state a relevant thesis, right? Support the thesis with a relevant argument using all but one of the documents. And that's listed there. And you'll see this on the AP test when you take it. Right? So, so using all the relevant, all the documents there means all but one, means in some manner or another, they are referenced or incorporated. Right? Some of you do that. I, I, I'm reading your 20s papers, and some of that is pretty good in using it. Some is stronger than others, but you know, in some manner or another, referencing those documents, all but one is what you need to do, right? Incorporate an analysis of all but one of your documents into the argument, we said that. Focus your analysis on each document, on, uh, for at least, uh, on, uh, of each document on at least one of the following, intended audience, purpose, historical context, or point of view. Support your argument with an analysis of historical uh, 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 examples outside the documents things that aren't in the documents or are part of your argument. Connect the historical phenomena relevant to your argument to broader events or processes. Synthesize the, the elements above into a pervasive essay that extends your argument. You know, you connect it to something outside of that time period or outside of the topic. I should tell you that many of you did that. On, I told you to do that on your 20s paper. It didn't really take off necessarily if you didn't. But many of you did that and, and, and did it fairly well. You know, I think it was an easy topic to do that with. 
you know, cultural conflict, because you can identify cultural conflict in, in the current time and make the connection. But some of you did it and did it very well. And that's one thing I want to stress. Do that. You know, in some way make a reference to something outside before or after the question. And you'll get that point. And remember, like the mean is less than two. So if you can write a decent thesis and do the synthesis point and somehow incorporate any kind of, you know, the documents in any manner or another, get a three, you're like 50% higher than the mean in the country, right? You know, so, you know, that synthesis point seems to be one that, that would be easy, right? But let's talk about this rise of conservatism, right, and where Reagan comes from. Ronald Reagan is elected to the presidency in 1980. At the time he's elected, he's 69 years of age. He was the oldest president until, I don't know if Trump is older than him or not. I think Trump is, yeah, is he, he's 70? Yeah. At the time he was the oldest, oldest, oldest person ever to be elected to the presidency. Prior to him it was William, not William Henry Harrison. Yeah, William Henry Harrison, is he the guy that died? Yeah. yeah, William Henry Harrison was the um, was the oldest president. There you go, Benny. When you go to those AIM competitions, there, those trivia things, there's another one for you, right? Um, William Henry Harrison. So, so Reagan was was 69 years of age. Reagan was was an actor by profession. Um, he, you know, he was um, uh, considered to be a B grade actor. He was a movie star, right? He. He had starred in movies. There are motion pictures in which Ronald Reagan, you know, was the, the, the star. He was never a, a mega movie star. And in the 1950s, he became involved in the Screen Actors Guild, right? The, the union of actors. And you know, as the as the president of the Screen Actors Guild, he had some kind of national prominence. Um, Reagan starts out politically as an admirer of Franklin Roosevelt, which he, he remained an admirer of Franklin Roosevelt through his administration as a New Deal Democrat. Um, but eventually, um, Reagan is going to kind of break with the direction of the New Deal and retreat into kind of a, a, a conservatism that was called a new conservatism. He runs for and is elected to the governorship of California. I believe he, I know he served for two terms. I think he served from 1968 to 1976 or 1964 to 1972, but he served as eight years as governor of, of California. And in that eight year period, he built a reputation as a new conservative. Now what did that mean? And what did he represent? What did he say? Well, let, let's do this. The conservatives, right, that emerged that Reagan represented, that is a part of this question, explain the reasons for the new conservatism that rose in prominence. Just for a second, take a, a one minute look at any of the documents and tell me if you can identify any of the reasons why that conservatism, what these people, I, I would say that there were things that they were upset with, right? There were things that they were upset with. What were those things based on these documents? Take a look at them and see if you can come up with any of the, the things they were upset with and why, used on, using those documents. And I don't even want to look at them for long. Right? I just want you to look at whatever one you're looking at. Don't all look at the first one. Right? Look, go through them and look at them briefly and tell me anything that strikes you as to what might have energized this faction of people that is going to elect Ronald Reagan to the presidency in 60. Anything you see. Go ahead, Mike. Low taxes. Yes. Okay. What document do you see that in? Uh, three. Three. So you see in document three that the complaint there is is high to well wait a minute. Is that document three? This letter is written to you by a law abiding citizen that feels discriminated against in favor of dope addicts and welfare cheats. 
I am, a, I am a widow who lives alone and works every day, pays my taxes, lives by the rules. I get very little from my taxes when I can no longer walk, walk the streets, and I'm afraid of my own home. So what's this lady mad about? Go ahead, Benny. Say it again. Yeah, maybe social programs. I mean, and she, you go ahead, uh, go ahead. Uh, okay. you know. Yeah, she's, she's, you know, um, dope addicts and welfare treats and social programs, and I'm paying my taxes, and they're slouching, right, and they're getting all this. And, and, and that notion of, of kind of the government support for idleness and hardworking people paying taxes is a part of what the new conservative comes from. Right? Now, that starts with the New Deal. Right? The New Deal <coughs> provides to the people. Remember, Hoover didn't like the New Deal because he thought these handouts will undermine people's willingness to work. Well, the New Deal was popular in the context of the Depression. Right? Well, then after the New Deal, you have this period of tremendous prosperity in the United States. And then in 1963, Kennedy is killed. Right? And his vice president, is a guy named Lyndon Johnson. Now, Lyndon Johnson, right, was was a, a, a Rooseveltian New Deal liberal. That was the, a, a senator from Texas. But Lyndon Johnson, even though he was an obscure, you know, he was obscure in some ways. You know, as Kennedy's vice president, and the Kennedys really disdained Lyndon Johnson. They called him Uncle Corn Puff, you know, yeah. and, and they thought he was like. And, and Johnson, Johnson was this incredibly crude guy. He would, he would call like his advisors in to talk with him when he was sitting on the toilet, right? So he'd be sitting on, you know, sitting on the toilet and say, come on in, Bob. You know, I can imagine these guys saying, well, you know, I mean, my goodness, Mr. President, you know, uh, you know, and he was just a crude, you know, uh, um, but he was like a brilliant politician that, that aspired to extend the New Deal, and he dies. Remember I said that Truman can't do it, Eisenhower doesn't want to do it, Kennedy isn't in office long enough to extend the New Deal, but Johnson does. He has something called the Great Society, a war on poverty. He ex expands all these social programs, welfare and other things. All government spending expands to try to alleviate poverty. That's what this woman's responding to. She's responding to what she sees as big government, right, benefiting the losers in society. And what's she doing? She's paying her taxes, right, and working hard, and she feels alienated. Wow, that was good. Let's see if we can do another one. Let's, yeah, go ahead, Casey. In document five, it appears that a lot of people were angry with America's weak foreign policy. Yes, right, America's weak foreign policy. So overseas, our goal is to preserve a world peace by keeping America strong. The philosophy um, once occupied a hallowed place in American diplomacy, but it has been casually dismissed at the outset of the Carter administrations, and the results have been shattered. Now, the most flagrant kind of example of this that people were furious with and you know, really kind of energized this new conservatism was, was, was in the presidency of Jimmy Carter. Now Carter, I should tell you, really you know, opens the door for Reagan because Carter is elected in 76. Right? Now we'll actually talk more about this in class. I mean, you, get, you guys get a, an advanced kind of conversation about this. Not, not before the AP test though. Carter is elected in the aftermath of Richard Nixon's resignation and potential impeachment. So Nixon is discredited in Watergate. You know, um, you know his actions are, are um, you know, uh, se severe enough for him to choose resignation rather than impeachment and removal. And the country is reeling from, from Nixon. And then I should tell you that after Nixon resigns the presidency, his replacement, Gerald Ford, Right, um, who was the vice president, pardoned Nixon of any crimes he might have committed without even any kind of trial. So here I am, I'm, I'm, I'm a cynical American. I said, oh, wait a minute, this bum did all this stuff, 
darn near ruined the country, you know, violated all these laws, and the guy that he took over, that took over for him, has pardoned him without any regard. Now, historians look back at that and say it was the right thing to do, right? But people were felt very alienated. So they wanted, in a president in 76, sincerity, right? Carter reeked of sincerity. I mean, he like was all about sincerity. He, he was, an, you know, he was a, the, 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 the a former governor from Georgia, right? You know, he was a Washington outsider. He was an officer in the military in World War II. He was a graduate of the Naval Academy. He seemed to have all the attributes America was looking for. He wasn't necessarily um, a full-time politician. He was an executive, right? <coughs> an officer, a governor. He taught Sunday school in his, his Baptist church in Plains, Georgia, this little town. So every Sunday morning, you know, former Governor Carter taught Sunday. He still does. He's like 92 years old. I still think he, he teaches that Sunday school class every Sunday morning. You know, his, his, his wife, Rosalind, was, he, was he, he argued to be an evangelical Christian, you know, a born-again Christian. You know, he, he told the country, I'll never lie to you, right? Carter could have never been elected at any other time in American history than 1976. So he gets elected, and his administration is disastrous in a number of ways, right? He, he takes a lot of actions. That, 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 that turn out to be disastrous. But one of the things that hurts it, and what they're referring to is, in 1979, in 1979, the uh, Iranian people had risen up against, well, they had risen up previously against their leadership. Iran had been under the leadership of a Shah, who was basically a secular figure you know, who had connections to the West, that was a supporter of the United States, who we supported. But the Shah of Iran and his family seemed to be corrupt, and there was an Islamic revolution in Iran where the Shah was forced to, to flee the country, he fled to Egypt, the Ayatollah Khomeini took over and established kind of an Islamic republic in, in Iran. You know, they retreated into kind of Islamic conservatism, and the Shah was abroad. But he got cancer, and he requested to go to the United States for treatment. And Carter admitted him, this is consistent with Carter, for medical treatment. The Iran went crazy. They wanted him back. They demanded the United States return him. They wanted to execute him. Carter refused to do that. And so they seized our embassy. What's the movie? You see the movie? Uh, Argo, Fargo, something. Uh, Argo was a couple of years ago. No, you see that movie? But anyways, they seized our embassy. They, they took over the embassy. They, they held hostage 250 American hostages in the Iranian hostage crisis. We demanded that they give them back. They refused. Right? They wouldn't give these people back. They said, you give us the Shah. We, give them back. The United States was unable to force them to do so. Carter eventually capitulated, capitulated to kind of public opinion, sent a, um, like a secret mission to try to, and the mission crashed in the desert. And Carter seemed weak. America seemed weak. You know, besides that, we had withdrawn from Vietnam in 75, in, in kind of, you know, in 73, 75, the North Vietnamese took over the country. We seemed weak. You know, um, and so that's another thing that the new right was 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 angry about. I mean, we used to be strong. We used to be great. You know, hardworking people used to be able to get ahead. But now the government, you know, is supporting the lazy. Pick another one. One more. One more. Just pick another. Pick, what, what, let's just do one more. This is wonderful. We, before the baseball players leave to to, to do fungo. Do they still do the fungo practice in baseball? Before they leave, pick another one. Pick another one. Which one did you pick? Go ahead. The security of like the house. Which one? Document uh, six. What's she against there? Uh, You'll never guess. Look at it. I am pleased that God blessed me with the privilege of being a woman. I have never been envious of the role of men but have respect for both sexes. Oh, women's yeah. rights? Yes, feminism. 
The other thing that the new right was mad about was that civil rights and feminism had gone too far. Right? Now the civil rights movement of the 1960s had crushed desegregation, but what the new right said, hey, hey that went too far. Now you might say, what, what would be an indication that if I was gonna argue that civil rights went too far, what would, what would really bother me if I'm in the new right that's out there? I mean, I don't know if you'll get this, but what would really bother me? Do you know what affirmative action is? Affirmative action. Affirmative action is, okay, we are going to hire four people. One has to be black, one has to be a woman, one has to be a man. Affirmative action. They say, okay, no, 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 no. Civil rights went too far. It's one thing to give people equality, but now it's, it's favoritism, right? And what's this woman say? Feminism, these women don't want equal rights. They want to be men, right? I mean, part of it. Part of the new, what the new right didn't like is they said, hey, this civil rights movement went too far. Now we're giving too much to minorities. Feminism went too far. Now we're giving, you know, women want to be men. They didn't like the Roe versus Wade 1973 abortion decision. They said this is a travesty, a war on the family, right? They, you know, look, gays come out of the closet in larger numbers in the 1970s. I mean, you know, that's much worse than now. Right? But look, in the 1970s when that started happening, they said, look, the family is being undermined. Homosexuals are everywhere. Abortion is, is here. Where is the traditional values of the country that made us great? You know, so what Reagan does is he taps the people who feel this way. Right? He taps this vein of people. <coughs> the people that think that government is supporting laziness and idleness and not supporting, you know, the common man. The people that think that the cultural, you know, the countercultural things of, of feminism and civil rights and gay rights and abortion and, you know, living with each other and, you know, premarital sex and drugs and all of those things have destroyed the values of society that America no longer was the strong, powerful, international country that we once had been, that taxes are too high and restrict kind of people's you know, ability to, 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 to start businesses and other things, and that the Democratic Party and even parts of the Republican Party were responsible for all of this. And the embodiment of it was Carter, and Carter Right, um, kind of argued that the problems that America was facing in the 70s, which incidentally, I don't know if I ever pointed this out to you, was my heyday, the 1970s, a decade and a half, right? But <clears throat> interestingly, Carter said that the problems facing America in the 70s are the fault of the people themselves. There was this famous speech. Carter got so despondent that he went up to, Camp, I think it was Camp David, for 12 days and cloistered himself. And he brought in a hundred like smart people to tell him what was wrong with America. And then he came and delivered what became known as the Malaise speech. And he said, what's wrong with America is we've, we've lost our commitment to work on our own problems, to set aside our differences. And he gives this speech which basically said that America, the reason we're suffering all these problems is because of you, right? Now, Ronald Reagan comes along in 1980. He gets the Republican nomination, and what he says is, look, America, the problems in America are not you or us. The problem is government. Now, look at... 10 documents to remember, right? Look at 10 documents to remember. Look at the 10th one, right? This is the embodiment of the Reagan revolution. The embodiment of the Reagan revolution, 10 is, and this is Ronald Reagan's first inaugural address in 1981. In the present crisis, notice how he says that, in the present crisis, government is not the solution to our problem, government is Right? So remember, Roosevelt said that government was the solution to protect 
right? The forgotten man, and that's the term that Roosevelt used, the for forgotten man from big business. And that was the New Deal, right? By 1980, the forgotten man had become the common man, and that's who Roosevelt was, was, was talking to. Not Roosevelt, Reagan was talking to. Go ahead, uh, baseball, I, I, I won't be offended. I know you told me you had to go. Go ahead. <coughs> I appreciate you guys coming. Right? You'll catch the last 10 minutes on, on, the, on the YouTube, right? You know, um, so, so, and good luck with the fungo uh, 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 hitting. Uh, fungo, that's what fungo? they do. What's fungo? Fungo. Um, they, they get the ball and they throw it real close to them and get it real, real fast. And it tries to get their reactions real fast, right? <laughs> well, so anyways, um, uh, what were we talking about? Oh, what were we saying? What was the same? Say it again. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Government is, is I was just saying, the, the forgotten man. But what Reagan comes along and says is that government now is the problem, not the solution. The government is favoring all the minorities, all the losers, all, you know, government is supporting all the people that are un-American, and it's the problem. And the solution is to get government out of the picture. The solution is to cut taxes, shrink government, promote private investment, build up a strong military, fight communism, and establish America as a power again. Now, this is exactly what people wanted to hear. What Reagan did with that rhetoric is he captured that New Deal coalition. Those people who had voted for Roosevelt because they thought that they, you know, that, that, that the government, had, the big business was taking advantage of them and expected the government to protect them. Those people now went to Ronald Reagan. They called them Reagan Democrats. He took over, you know, that, that narrative. He got those people. Now, you know, I mean, Reagan wins. I mean, Carter's the incumbent president in, in, in 1980. Reagan wins 51% of the vote. Carter gets 41% of the vote, right? And there's a third party candidate by the name of John Anderson. He gets 7% of the vote, but Reagan gets like almost 400 electoral votes. It's like a landslide in the electoral college. Carter only wins five states. You know, he is like roundly bounced out of office, and Reagan, you know, exploits what's called this new right, this new conservatism, you know, kind of suggesting that the role of government is, is, is skewed, that the common man, the average standard American, has been lost in a world of feminism and you know uh, equal opportunity and affirmative action and social programs and all of these things have distorted America and Reagan promised to straighten things out right when he took office in 1980 now here's the thing I should tell you that that people were not necessarily disappointed the people that voted for Reagan were not necessarily disappointed in what he did because he was reelected in 1984 by a larger margin than he was elected in 1980 right so reagan was i mean when reagan was reelected he was 73 years old right you know so so you know he was you know, an old man but I, I should tell you this you know reagan the thing about reagan is and i, I don't want to cast any kind of political things i mean there's a little bit of a tint of hate in some of the things that that you know Reagan could be associated with, particularly when it came to civil rights and, and, and other things. But see, the thing that the way the reason that Reagan pulled it off is because he wasn't hateful. He was very likable, right? You know, so Reagan had this you know kind of new conservative attitude that the world was falling apart and that there was kind of almost like the traditionalism that he wrote about in the 1920s, but Reagan was kind of amicable and seemed to be kind-hearted and didn't really, he, he, he certainly wasn't Trump, you know, with that kind of bombastic attitude, you know. He was very, again, likable. And so on one hand, he connected with people who felt alienated much like Roosevelt had done. On the other hand, he was you know, very likable in that connection. 
which really builds his popularity. And he is triumphantly reelected in 1984. Now, I mean, historians have, have kind of debated the effectiveness of, of what he had done. You know, did he really do, you know, right for the country? You know, um, his vice president was George H. Bush, right? Which was the dad of George W. Bush. He was elected in 1988. You know, he was elected in 88, which, you know, was a, the legacy of, of Reagan continuing. In, in 92, Bush ran against Bill Clinton. And what Clinton argued in 92 was kind of, I'll give you Reagan, but the democratic flavor of it, right? I'll give you, you know, kind of the democratic variation of the Reagan revolution, right? So we're going we're gonna to tighten up on government and do other things, but we're not going to have the same kind of rhetoric about you know, we're going to be more inclusive. I mean, Clinton was considered to be a relatively conservative Democrat. The real renunciation of Reagan on some level is Obama. You know, that, that, that brought back more of the traditional kind of inclusiveness that had been maybe swung too far. You know, I mean, Reagan is saying, hey, look, you know, the blacks, they're getting too much, and, you know, all the minorities, and, you know, the Hispanics, they're getting too much, and, you know, uh, um, you know, everybody's paying their tax, all these people are on welfare, and, you know, and that resonated to a lot of people. You know, by the time Obama comes along, those, those minority groups and other people kind of had been alienated for some time. So, look, we're going to try to be more inclusive, you know, to this, and it, it kind of resonated. I, 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 Still early to to, uh, to determine what, what Trump all means, you know, in terms of that. You know, it's, 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 you know, I kind of would say that, in in my opinion, Trump tapped part of Reagan. You know, he, he, he tapped the same people that Reagan tapped. That that kind of disenchanted working class person that felt left out, right? I mean, that's what Reagan tapped. That's who Roosevelt tapped. You know, I mean, they tapped them for different reasons, but that's that's who they tapped. And I think Trump tapped that a little bit too. Um, you know, I, I, I mean, and some you know some of the things that he, that he said, you know, he resonated. With that. You lost your job because of foreign trade. You know, you lost your job because there's too much immigration. You know, your standard of living isn't as great because of these things. You know, is, is, is it? Is that true? I mean, Reagan said, hey, you lost your job because of affirmative action. Or you're paying too high of taxes because we're giving people welfare for nothing. You know, and people bought that. You know, and that, and that you know, that mobilized it. Well, all right. Um, um, that, that's enough. We'll, we'll stop with that. Does anybody have any questions about that? I hope that gives you a good overview of that. If, and I think it will. And, you know, and, and think about that in terms of synthesis. If you have to connect something out, I mean, I don't think they're going to ask another question about Reagan as a document-based question, or about environmentalism in 1974, which was another question, I think, last year, which we were fully and utterly unprepared for, more so than this. I mean, from this, I'm hoping you can see that you could pick things up on your own from the documents and try to put together uh, a thing. I'm hoping that we have something uh, a little bit more manageable next year. So last year's was environmentalism in the 1970s? It might have been, no, it was women's movement. Oh. From 1945 to 1975. Utterly unprepared. We can't go 0 and 3 for the document base. This is going to be a good year. Yeah, I remember Joel came home and he was like, he's like, yeah, we had a whole document based question on something we never even talked about. Yeah, we can't go 0 and 3. Yeah, Joel is not happy. He got a 5. Though, yeah, he did. Where's your friend Liz Temple? Where's Liz Temple had to go to a UPMC uh, job shadow type interview today. Tis ah. Yeah, I'm missing my friend Tis today. I see. Well, I'm so she happy I got. See, I'm so happy I got a. Um, Good thing is at least one comp in here. Comp, where are you at? You're still on. You're still.
too.